Um, tonight I want to start with a, a student who, um, uh, who I've gotten to know over the last uh, six months. He participated in one of our civil rights trips, but I've also been familiar with his presence on the campus for some time. His name is Michael Moynihan, um, but he's known as Renaissance on campus and in the area for his work in the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, he's also uh, a student who's a double major on this campus in history and philosophy. And that's part of why he's called Renaissance is because he has such a wide range of knowledge and experiences. And so I've asked Michael to come and say a few words um, about his, his own history and his, his work he's doing. Um, but I just want to kind of, as I bring him, ask him to come up here, say that he was in Olympia today. It was uh, lobby, lobby day, students go down there and so do others to make their causes known. Um, and he was down there as a citizen activist and um, he barely got back here in time. Um, and I, I just think it's a real, a real testament to his multiple things he holds in tension. Um, all of the commitments that he has, that he was there as a citizen activist today um, and then had to move, drive a few people around when he got back here and then raced over here to be here. That's the quality of the kinds of people we're talking about here. These are not apathetic millennials as the stereotype goes. They're not. They're incredibly engaged young people and I, um, it's my privilege to work with these individuals. So please help me to welcome Michael Moynihan. Michael. Talk about. Thanks. I'll pull you off when you're done. <laughs> so one of my skills is I'm a hip hop artist. <laughs> Doing the thing of mysterious, rigging the bullet instructions just the beginning. I'm a poet. I've been dead. I've been to prison. I walked across the country. I used to be a priest. I owned a construction company. I was the treasurer of one school. I was the president of another. I've been doped out. I've OD'd, been a gang member, been jumped by over 70 people, was the valedictorian of my last school. I'm almost done with this degree if I can avoid failing my classes. <laughs> I'm a Black Lives Matter activist. I helped pass a resolution in Seattle, Resolution 31614, Zero Use of Detention for Youth and Juvenile. They're still building the $210 million juvenile, but they do have a vision for something else. And it was the history degree in my research into mass incarceration, police brutality, and a school to prison pipeline that helped us to get that done with an alternative method called restorative justice. And we implemented that down there in the city of Seattle, City Hall. Just a few months prior to that, one of my friends was down at King County Metropolitan Council and spoke longer than their two minute period for a public comment and was arrested. The struggle that we battle with is very, very difficult. You know, they claim that they're not hearing from us. And when I say us, I, I tend to mean the black community and even more generally, marginalized communities, communities that are pushed to the margin, but yet somehow in this society are held central to the function and the dynamics of this great country of ours. Let me pull back. I was just having a conversation outside and we we're talking about the existence of slavery in the United States. And most people don't know that it is still legal in the United States for slaves to exist. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, except for those who have been convicted of a crime. After that, convict leasing came in. And so then they were selling slaves from the prison, prisoners to the same plantations that they worked on just prior to the 13th Amendment being ratified by the states. Jurisprudence, one of my other focuses in my philosophy ethics, teaches us that like I own my body and you own your body and I can't come up to you and touch your body unless you waive that right to privacy, unless you give me consent to touch your body. And the way that gets broken down in the law is means you own your body. Nobody else has a right to your body because you own your body. 
So then how can somebody else take your body? Like, so when the police arrest you and they take you into custody, technically by law, what that means is they have determined you unfit to own your own body. Slavery by definition is not the labor that they produce from that slavery. Slavery by definition is the ownership of one human being by another. So slavery is still legal. And we haven't even touched on the farmers that are working in this country that can't get out. We haven't talked about the human trafficking that's still allowed to permit in Seattle is one of the largest human trafficking locations on the West Coast. Washington State has the fourth largest prison factory system in the country. And Washington State law says that they're not granted a wage. They're granted a gratuity, a gift, a tip. My brother is in a prison system right now and he gets 62 cents an hour. And if one day he chooses not to go to work, they throw him in the hole for three weeks. He doesn't have a choice on whether or not he goes to work. Slavery still exists in this country. And I'm talking very calm right now. I didn't necessarily know what it was that I was going to talk about. And usually when I talk about these things, I'm very, very, very angry. It's hard not to be angry about these things. And when we went down to Olympia today, we went down there to challenge one of the things was the body-worn cameras that they're trying to pass the legislation through so that the police can be held more accountable. That's what it's prefaced as. And yet, each and every single different jurisdiction can write their own rules for how those body cameras are gonna be worn, how those body cameras are gonna be used. And then each different jurisdiction has discretionary power about whether or not to keep those cameras on, when to turn them on, and when to turn them off. And then they have this, this line in there, section 5.1c. It says that any time an officer doesn't believe that they're going to get the type of information that they want to get from the person that they are interrogating, that they can shut off their camera. But that is diametrically opposed to the reason that we were asking for cameras in the first place to hold them accountable. And when we presented this to the representative who wrote and produced and pushed out and promoted this bill, he says he's not going to change anything, that he wants it just the way that it is. We went down there about a month and a half ago to go talk to the people to try to get them to pull it out. We went to one of their meeting sessions and they only gave us a minute and a half to talk. And when we told them that this was antithetical to it, what I heard other people in the audience more complaining about was their privacy concerns. You see, we're worried about people dying in the streets. We're worried about a brutal police force that doesn't have any checks or balances on their limits of power because black people are not valued the same as other people in this country. And we can see this in the ubiquitous over and over and over again in all of the different slangs and the way that the police act as a terrorizing and colonizing force within our communities. Now, any of you can pull me aside afterwards and I can get you information and I can get you data to back up every single thing that I'm saying. But what I heard down there was that people were more concerned with that stash of jewelry that the robber didn't get in their house. They're more concerned about somebody seeing something online than they are about the bodies that are being harmed. That bill is not about police accountability. That bill is about privacy, and yet it was prefaced and promoted to the public as being something that was going to hold the police accountable. That's what we went down there to challenge, and we did. And they ignored us yet again. Oftentimes, and I'll finish up real quick so that you can have your stage. <laughs> I talk to my people and I've been trying to figure out what it is that I would share, what it is that would be most effective to share with all of you people here today that would help our country to grow, that would help our citizenry and our society to develop as human beings much quicker, faster, better, and to achieve a greater standard of living for us all. Like, like, what can I give you right now that could help us to achieve that? 
And I know a lot of people don't necessarily agree with all the ways and manners in which people protest, right? Because we're really unapologetically black. Black lives matter. All lives certainly do or will when we can make sure that all lives are treated the same. Let's go back to the 13th Amendment. Let's take a look at the massive prison industrial complex. We have 5% of the world's population, but we have over 25% of the world's prisoners. The greatest consumer of prison labor is the military industrial complex, the Department of Defense in this country. A lot of people don't know a lot of these weird little data points, but if we can pull apart that 13th Amendment, if we can make sure that it's a positive language and that slavery is abolished in this country the way that the police treat us while we're in the streets, they will no longer have the motivation to be slave catchers. The school to prison pipeline will change and eradicate by taking a look at some of the pillars that hold up the system. Voting is very, very important. This country was based on racialized language and ideologies. And if we're not considering that when we're making our decisions, if we're making our decisions based on economic principles alone, on profit and loss, cost benefit analyses, and we're not taking a look at the social factors and the very real social impacts that happens as a result of those decisions, if justice does not become a component of our lens, if we are not looking at the worst and the least well off within our society and how the decisions, policies, and laws we enact, are going to impact them, then we fail as human beings because we're not actually being morally culpable and responsible to our brothers and sisters that we are sharing this world with. So by tearing apart some of those pillars and looking at where the real dynamic is, like another part of this big, huge problem is that we have over 12 million people in the United States that are disenfranchised. The justification for that was in the 14th Amendment where they have a crime clause in that one as well that permits for the, the denial of those rights from people. So we don't even have an actual democratic society. And when prisoners are moved from one state to another, they're, count, they, they're denied their right to vote and they're counted as bodies so that that state can have more seats in Congress, just like the three-fifths clause. We're looking at many contradictions that we thought we had gotten rid of. Part of the problem with our voting amendments is that they're negative language. And I'm sure David Domke has talked about this already. And if he hasn't, I hope he talks about it again. But what it does is it says we cannot deny the right to vote based on this status or this status or this status. But it allows for loopholes around that to work their way through it so that we can deny people the right to vote. If instead we had something that was a positive affirmation that said something like, all United States citizens have the right to vote. And their right to vote cannot be revoked for any reason. And citizenship, once either naturalized or born here, cannot be denied the right. Maybe then this system would change. And so as I thought about what to bring forward to you for something that could help to promote and to create a better society for us to help us grow as human beings for each other, look at those 13th and those 14th Amendments in that Constitution that we bring and we find so many of our ideals about who we think we are and how we identify with other people. Because the Supreme Court and the legislatures and all of the laws that they enact or the ways that they react to the laws when those laws are infringed upon, go back to that Constitution. And if we don't agree that the way that that Constitution is, it only requires two thirds of us to make a big, big difference for our children's lives and our children's children's lives. And that's what I wanted to leave you with. So I hope you all make some good choices in the near future. <laughs> Give your lessons. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.